Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 21st of March, 2023. It is a Tuesday morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. We have a big show coming up. You know, we talk about the market often, and you can hear me sit here and bloviate and, and give you my views, my opinions, share the facts. Uh, I tend to be a visual learner. I like to see the charts. I like to see the way patterns move. So today what I did is I put together a little chart packet here for us about the economy and the market, um, some asset classes as well. And we're going to truly break down what's going on with the market, what's going down with the economy. And I think by the time we're done, you have a completely different view looking at this market today. Coming up right now on Making Money. If you're holding out hope for a bull market, then please pay close attention. According to legendary investor Mark Chaikin, who Jim Cramer famously said he never bet against, you need to prepare for the next wave of volatility to hit U.S. stocks. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years, with a 100% success rate predicting where stocks will go next. Now, the man who's just spotted it is sounding the alarm. During Mark's 50-year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history, including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and today found in every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now, Mark's inviting you to join him as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming months. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas free for those who tune in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. And you don't have to wait until March 28th to get started. For a sneak peek on Mark's big reveal, go to ChakenEvent2023.com. That's ChakenEvent2023.com. Once again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 21st of uh, March. It's a Tuesday morning. We are taping this on Friday the 17th, which explains my ridiculously green tie-dye sweatshirt, which I'll admit I just bought and I paid way too much for. But I do love it and it's comfortable. But this is, uh, you know, one time a year I can get away with wearing this. Uh, it being St. Patrick's Day, the 17th of March, uh, the day I'm taping this, um, where nobody looks at me funny. And I'll be getting on a plane to Nicaragua tonight uh, with this sweatshirt on. They will probably look at me very funny when I get down there, but that's okay. They usually look at me funny anyway. But as I mentioned, we're going to dive, we're going to dive into some charts here today. Uh, I think we're going to have a, a really good discussion, one-way discussion, clearly. Uh, but breaking down kind of where we've been, where we are, and where I think we're going to go based off the charts and the trends and the economy and the stock market itself. So we'll talk about that in one second. Before we dive into that, though, uh, we just kind of get it caught up a little bit over the last week and a half. Obviously, I'm not going to, you know, uh, beat this to death, but we had Silicon Valley Bank fail. We had uh, Signature Bank fail. We had Silicon Valley Bank on the 17th today come out and file Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, we've had the market, believe it or not, actually hold up fairly well this week, um, which is really odd. I mean, if you think about everything that's happened, I, I would think personally that We'd, we'd be have a big down down week, but um, you know if you look at what the S and P did last week, um, we were basically unchanged to up a little bit in, at the S and P all last week. That's that's pretty amazing to me. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of charts of the of the market here in a minute, uh, but overall, where we are right now with with what's going to happen uh, with the banking industry is I, I think we really have they they have a backstop. Uh, the government's proven. Um, time and time again, that they will backstop um, poor decisions uh, many times, especially in the banking and the finance industry. And it appears they're going to continue to do that. So that gives you a bit of a floor uh, below where a lot of these financials are trading right now. So I still think there's huge upside. Uh, as I mentioned uh, on Monday after all this went down, um, not this Monday, last Monday, I bought a basket of six financial uh, stocks, some regional, some big ones, brokerage firms. And uh, I, I'm going to look to hold those probably for a few months as this kind of mess 
goes through and eventually these stocks get back to where they should be and be fairly valued. And I think that could take a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Uh, and, and I think it's, for me, it's a great investment idea, uh, strategy, and I'm okay being patient with that. That's very short term for me uh, to do that. Um, that being said, with the overall market, a lot of it's going to hinge on what happens tomorrow. Uh, the Fed's meeting today and tomorrow. And on Wednesday, uh, midday, we'll have the decision from uh, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and uh, on where uh, interest rates will, will be. And just a week and a half, almost two weeks ago, uh, the odds were that there was going to be a 50 basis point hike, 0.5%. That went down to 0.25%, sorry, 25 basis points uh, after the Silicon Valley Bank situation. It basically right now is about 50 50% chance between no hike and a 25 basis point hike. So from basically 85, 90% chance of 50 down to a coin toss between no hike at all and 25 basis points hike. Uh, what a, you know, what a two weeks can change is amazing. If Powell comes out tomorrow and does nothing, I think the market probably rallies a little bit. If there's 25, I think the market probably stays a bit flat. The problem with doing nothing, and I'm not saying that that that's not what should be done. I think there's, nothing should be done tomorrow. And I think you guys know my view on the Fed. I think nothing should be done tomorrow. Um, I think they're going to do 25. I put it. I think I would do zero if I was Jerome Powell. Zero, I think, could scare the market a little bit. Could scare investors thinking like, "Wow, how did he go from being this hawkish two weeks ago, just with you know a couple of bank failures, but still?" Does he know something more we don't know? Is there something worse going on underneath uh, the hood? So I think that you won't see the market rally that much off it. I might be wrong, uh, but that's, that's my view. And again, I think they do 25. Uh, I believe they should do nothing, uh, in my opinion. So speaking of which, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, decision making uh, for this will be based off of uh, inflation. So let me take a look at a couple of inflation uh, numbers here for you. and. Um, give you an idea of really what's going on. And first, we're going to take a look at the PPI, which came out last week. The producer price index fell to the lowest level since March 2021. And as you can see here on a chart, folks, I mean, it's really it's down to 4.6%. It was up around 12% and it's come down from there. So it's really fallen off a cliff. And we're at the, as I said, the lowest level uh, going back to uh, early uh, 2021, uh, and, and to me, uh, this can continue to fall and will continue to fall. So when the Fed looks at something like that, which they should, the producer price index is different than the consumer price index. Producer price index is the producers, people that are making the goods, their input costs. Consumer price index is the cost for you and I to go out and live, shelter, food, energy, et cetera. So this is the producer price index, which if you think about it, should be more of a leading indicator than the CPI. Because if the, the, the amount of cost for, for me to produce something as a, as a company, let's say, I'm going to pass it along to you. If my costs are coming down, not saying they do this, but they have the ability to then lower prices, which would lower inflation for the consumer. So it's a trickle down effect somewhat. So that is the, that's the CPI, or sorry, PPI. Now let's take a look at the CPI. Came in last week at 6%. But as again, as you can see, Look where it peaked uh, in July there of 2022, and it's been rolling over ever since. Again, we are in, in, in a, a clear breaking of that uptrend, and I wouldn't say, call it a clear downtrend, but we are clearly moving lower uh, on the CPI, on the PPI, and I believe what the Fed has been doing is actually working. I don't like the way that they did it. I don't like the fact that they're still extremely hawkish because they're impatient, but it is working. It takes time for this to trickle through the market. Um, you know, Redfin, I get a lot of numbers from them. That's the, the housing uh, website. Uh, but they have a lot of great numbers. And, um, you know, what I want to show you here is uh, the median uh, sale price. Um, and this looks at um, year over year. So as you can see here, look at this. Uh, we're now down. This is national average. We're down, down to year over year to low single digits. And, you know, the last time that we were down here was obviously COVID 2020. Prior to that, uh, we need to go back to about 2012, uh, which you're looking at, you know, at the point where um, housing fell quite a bit uh, back then. So we've come down dramatically. And what we have not seen yet, folks, 
We have not seen the shelter component of the CPI come down. And I've talked about this already. The shelter component of the CPI still contributed a large portion to that CPI because the way the government calculates it, it's extremely lag. And people will argue with me about this, and this is a debate that nobody's wrong or right. It's a debate, um, but there's no debating the fact that typically the government will see a lag in their shelter costs for the CPI. It's just what it is. So now that these are rolling over, and I'm going to show you a couple more housing uh, charts here. There's another one. This is the Case-Shiller uh, Composite 20 Home Price Year-Over-Year -year Index. It was up in the 20s, and now we're down to 4.6. Again, rolling over. I mean, this is continually, I could show you so many different angles of shelter through rents, um, through home prices. Obviously, we know mortgage rates have gone up. They've dipped a little bit because of the whole banking crisis because rates have gone down. But mortgage rates have gone up a lot. Affordability has dropped quite a bit. Um, and, and again, it's, it's leading to lower home prices, lower rents, which in turn will lower CPI, which in turn will force the Fed to not do anything to stop, which in turn will lead to a stock market rally. That is why you're seeing the CPI hold up so damn, or sorry, the S&P the hold up so damn well in the face of this banking crisis that we're dealing with right now. So I have a couple other um, charts here I want to show you. So here's a look at, again, this is from Redfin, uh, the uh, rent growth uh, year over year down to 1.7% in February. We peaked at 17.5% early last year. This is the lowest level we've seen since early 2021. Huge, huge difference. Now let's take a look at this. This is the median asking rent in February is $1,937. Again, we're not down to February low, 21 lows, but we're, again, continually coming down. The trend has ended going up. We're at the lowest level now we've seen in about six months. So things are getting better as far as shelter, rent, home prices are concerned. And we're going to continue to move in that direction, folks. And again, as that happens, CPI comes down. I mentioned this already. Inflation comes down. The Fed pauses. Historically, stocks rally. It's that simple. We're not overthinking this. My timing of exactly when all this happens, you know, probably by the end of middle of end of this year. But I, I don't know. The Fed's a wild card. I don't know what could happen. We have another bank failure. I don't know. But I'm investing for years out. Years out. This is a great opportunity to buy some quality, quality companies. Let's keep that in mind. Another index here, which I found interesting. This is the um, Baltic Index. It's a global container freight index. Look at this. This is from Charlie Biello, uh, great chartist. I follow him on Twitter. If you don't follow him, I think you should. Puts a lot of great information out. Uh, but this is uh, the rates for the global container uh, freight index down 86% from 2021 through last week. We're back down to levels basically pre-pandemic. Think about that. Think about that. That The, the amount of, of, you know, Money, companies save shipping things around the world. We don't have these bottlenecks. We don't have supply chain issues anymore. Again, this all, folks, ends up going to cost, to prices, which, again, leads to lower inflation. All right, enough with inflation. Let's talk about the markets now. Here's a chart. Look at this. This is, as of, this is last week's numbers. I'm taking a look at the ARK Innovation ETF, ARKK, that's Kathy Woods, very aggressive, obviously. I'm taking a look at the QQQ, which is a NASDAQ 100, which had a hell of a week last week. The S&P 500, SPY, and the DIA, which tracks the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow 30. Take a look at this last week. This tells me something. When ARK Innovation leads on a week after the second largest bank collapse in the history of our country, then we have a second bank collapse. And the aggressive stocks are up 6%. The NASDAQ, QQQ, NASDAQ 100, that's the big names, Apples, Googles, NVIDIAs, you name it, Amazon's up 5.5%. Then the S&P up 2.8, and then the Dow up 1.4. So that's, that's telling me that even though you don't want to see a bank fail, we do, there's something that investors are feeling right now that they're thinking longer term. Because I think what's happening here is 
They're thinking and considering what I have been considering for a while now, that the Fed will stop raising interest rates sooner rather than later. That means rates will not continue to go up as they have for the last year and a half, two years. And who does that benefit? It often benefits some of these tech companies, the innovation companies, which is why you're seeing them go up. So that's why I want to share that with you, because I think a lot of people don't know why. But I think, again, it's not black and white. We have to take a couple steps to figure out where, why we're doing that, where we're at. And again, we're at a place now where I think we have attractive valuations. We're not going straight up from here, 100%. We do not. But again, longer term, I think we're much higher than where we are here today. Speaking of much higher, let's take a look at how Bitcoin and gold did last week you know, in the face of this, because, you know, the, the gold should be crushing it, right? Well, gold did pretty damn good uh, up about. And this was this was just um, the Friday prior through Thursday close of the 16th. Uh, gold uh, GLD was up about 5%, the tracking in uh, ETF for that. Uh, at the same time, uh, during that five day run, Bitcoin was up 23 and a half percent. And I will say, folks, on Friday, uh, the 17th, when we're taping this right now, gold was up again another, I want to say, 2% or so. So let's call it, uh, let's call it 7% uh, since in that six day span. However, Bitcoin went through the freaking roof and is up about over 30% in that time frame. So again, folks, People love to hate Bitcoin. They say it doesn't do its job, but it actually has been doing its job. It's been a great hedge during this banking crisis. So why has it been such a good hedge? We know why gold is because people are freaking out that uh, we can bail out these banks. The dollar is not worth crap anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I, I get that. I get the case of gold. Safety. But everybody calls Bitcoin a risky asset, a risk on asset. I tend to disagree. I think it's been held as value very, very well. And why? Because the same reason gold is going up. Because people don't trust the banks. They don't trust the government. They don't trust the Fed. They don't trust, I don't know how many dollars on me right now, the good old greenback. That's why they're going into Bitcoin. And that way is why Bitcoin is breaking out to a multi-month high. And that is why the chart I'm going to show you here in one second says it all. Here we go, folks. This is year to date, Bitcoin versus gold. Bitcoin's up 51%. Again, not counting the big rally last Friday. Gold's up 5%. Again, not counting the big rally last Friday. But it's not even comparable how strong Bitcoin has been. And let me show you one more reason that I'm so high in Bitcoin right now and for the rest of the year. This is a chart from Bitwise Asset Management. It's where uh, Matt Hogan's at. I've had him on a show a couple of times. It shows the annual return of Bitcoin going back to 2011. You can see 2011, great year, 2012, great year, 2013, great year, 2014, done. 2015, okay year, still 34%, great return. 16, 17, great years, 2018, loses three quarters of its value. 19, great year, 20, year, great year, 2021, good year. 2022, loses two thirds of its value. And we jump ahead to 2023. So far, we're up about 56%, give or take, you know, obviously fluctuates a lot. So are we on path here? to have another three-year bull market? I think so. I do. And I still think Bitcoin hits 100 grand in uh, the next couple of years. My timing is off and I'll admit it. I thought it would have happened by now. Um, but I didn't anticipate interest rates uh, being raised by the Fed in the fastest pace in the history of the Fed. So I didn't anticipate that either. I don't think anybody did. And nobody that I know of that actually said it before it happened. Uh, I can say it after the fact. So uh, I didn't see that. And I think that's what really held back Bitcoin. Uh, but at this point, honestly, uh, I, I think we're ready uh, for Bitcoin to rock and roll. Um, two more things I want to talk about. We're going to wrap it up. One is on Friday, uh, FedEx came out with earnings. They had blockbuster earnings, stock gapped up. I'm going to show you the chart here really quick. Here's a chart of FedEx um, up at the best levels since uh, August of last year. Now, its competitor, obviously, is UPS. Let's take a look at that chart. You can see here at UPS, um, it's down on this Friday. But again, off the lows and working its way up, not far from uh, hitting the best level since September. Why did I show you that? Because those are great indicators of the overall economy. Because um, obviously, with there's less people ordering things, pandemic was different because we're stuck home, so everybody's ordering things. 
But you know, that's a, they're great indicators of the overall economy. And uh, FedEx came out and they raised their guidance pretty handily. Um, they now see a profit for this full year between fourteen dollars and sixty cents and fifteen dollars and twenty cents. Previously, they said between thirteen and fourteen bucks. So it's a big increase. And that again, that's based on the economy being strong, and that's a good thing. We want the economy to be strong. Last thing I'm going to show you is just kind of something funny. Uh, I saw this on Twitter and I want to share it with you, um, but I thought it was kind of funny. And this is, as you can see, um, that Forbes, uh, they're really visionaries over there, as this post says. Um, I'll go through, who you know, this is, this is uh, Elizabeth Holmes in the top left, who is either in jail or going to jail, obviously, uh, with uh, Theranos. Uh, then we have uh, FTX there, uh, SBF, um, going to be going to jail, most likely. Uh, and then we have, you know, Adam Newman, the, the WeWork guy, not going to jail that I know of, and I don't think he did anything wrong, but boy, did he blow up a pretty amazing company, um, you know, after the $20 billion office party. And then just recently, as you can see here, Forbes 2023, America's best banks. And we know that a uh, bank that was on there that made it for the fifth straight year, Silicon Valley Bank. And a couple of weeks later, we see what happens. So I always like to call it, you know, the, the whole magazine cover uh, trend or uh, indicator, if you will. And, you know, a few times in the last couple of months, Barron's, which I love, I read it every weekend, uh, has had some covers a week or two after we recommend a stock in a certain trend and they do a highlight in the trend. I'm always happy. My team's happy because it's like, OK, you know, we're thinking along the lines of a lot of other people. That being said, it always scares me because I'm like, damn, when they when they start talking about it, it's probably not the best timing. So we'll see how they play out. But uh, just something funny I want to throw out there on this St. Paddy's Day. Again, I know it's the 21st that you're watching this when it goes out. But on my St. Paddy's Day, I wanted to uh, do something to laugh at. Not that we're laughing at people losing money and people going to jail, but something to be lighthearted, if you will, before we wrap up for the, uh, for the week here and wrap up your Tuesday. So, again, thank you very much for watching. I hope these charts helped uh, kind of give you an indication of where the economy is going. Um, where inflation is going, where the Fed's going, and ultimately where the stock market's going to go, which will be higher uh, in the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, in my opinion. So again, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you on Thursday. Once again, I'm Matt McCall, and this is Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.